when we start working trig identities, we get to start with a base eight of them. These are the ones that we get to play with at the start. What our job becomes in a little bit is manipulating those into other values so I can get to what I want. Now we'll get more into that part tomorrow. We're gonna do a little more basic today. But one thing I wanted to mention with these is anything that you can do with a normal equation, you can use to manipulate these, including squaring things, factoring things out, adding, subtracting, whatever you wanna do. So for instance, let's say you wanted to have cosine squared to use for something, but you didn't want this plus sign with it. Okay, I could subtract that to the other side. I could do like cosine squared theta equals one minus sine squared theta, and then use the cosine in that different way. I could do the same thing with sine. If I wanted sine on a side by itself for some purpose, which will become a little more clear in a little while. I could solve that identity for sine squared. Subtract the cosine squared to the other side. So I'm just wanting you to see, you can manipulate these if you wanted a negative cosine or a negative sine. You could do all of those different things. Here in this next one, if I wanted tangent by itself, I could do tangent squared equals secant squared minus one. Okay, I already have secant by itself. So it's just options I have, or if I want cotangent by itself. But again, all of these are interchangeable. If I wanted to have sine equals one over keys, cosecant, that's legal. But we'll talk more about those manipulations as we kind of get a little closer. But with the identities, that's something that can help me out quite a bit. But for this first part, we're gonna be looking for exact values, so again, no decimals, of each expression if my theta is between zero and 90. In other words, if it's in quadrant one. Well, one thing we know about everything in quadrant one is everything's positive. So, here's basically what I'm gonna be doing especially handy in this case if you have a pencil. So find the exact value. We know that we are going to have a triangle here that if it's based in the first quadrant is going to look something like this. Because we always know our reference angle base is at the origin. And otherwise, we know we're gonna have a right triangle out of the deal. So. Find the exact value. If cotangent equals four, four over one, find tangent. But wait a minute, let's think about this. What relationship do cotangent and tangent have? They are inverses. They're inverses, okay. So to find tangent, if I know cotangent, I just take its reciprocal. They're gonna be positive. I've got the answer. Now they're not all quite going to be that simple, unfortunately. Sometimes I may have to do a little work. For instance, if cosine of theta is square root of 3 over 2, find cosecant. Now again, they're not inverses. Cosine's inverse is secant, so it doesn't quite work that way for me. But it gives me some information. It lets me know which two sides do I normally have when I'm working with cosine. Yeah. I have adjacent and hypotenuse. So I'm like, okay, so I'd have the square root of three and two. So what I would do then is I would have to know, since this is the, excuse me, my inverse of sine, sine's opposite over hypotenuse, this is gonna be hypotenuse over opposite, but I don't know opposite. How do I find opposite? How do I figure out my mystery side? 
See, I've got you all thinking such fancy things for 30, 60, 90s, and 45, 45, 90s. In a basic right triangle, if you know the hypotenuse and a leg, how do you find the other leg? Yeah, we're just going to use the Pythagorean theorem. So I'm like, okay, so I'd have, I can subtract my hypotenuse squared minus my leg squared. So 4 minus 3 means my opposite's just going to be 1. So my cosecant would be hypotenuse over opposite, or just plain old 2. So again, yeah, don't make life overcomplicated on yourself with these. So let's see here. See, this is where I like the eraser, because now I can just go, okay. Keep playing with the same triangle here. So if sine opposite over hypotenuse is 3 over 5, what's cosine? For cosine, I need adjacent and hypotenuse, so I got the hypotenuse. Yeah, 4, because 25 minus 9 is 16, and its square root is 4, using the Pythagorean theorem again. And I can get to my solution that way. Let's see here. One more time with these, and then we kind of start to see how this is going to move us around. So tangent, opposite over adjacent. Oh, good, just like the same one we just did. Okay. Find the cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. All positive because they're all in quadrant one. So it's still, it's gonna let me find those exact values. But again, nothing fancy just some Pythagorean theorem stuff. The only thing I'm going to have to watch for is as I move, I have to pay attention to what quadrant I'm in. Because now I'm between 90 and 180, which is quadrant 2. And what's positive in quadrant 2? Okay. So sine and cosecant are going to be my only two trig functions that are going to be positive over here. So when I get something like, if the cosine is negative 7 over 8, you're like, wait a minute. So I'm supposed to figure out where these negatives and things go? Let's think about it for a second. Adjacent over hypotenuse. Your hypotenuse, when you're dealing with these, will never be negative. Why? Because I'm squaring something to get it. So here, think about what direction you're going in the x-axis. I'm going to the left. What happens when you go left on the x-axis? It gets negative. So I've got my negative 7. I've got my 8. For secant, oh, secant, hmm, oh yeah, inverse of cosine. Wish I'd have looked at that right off the bat. So then I look and I go, okay. That was kind of good though so I could see where I can technically get a negative side for my triangles when I'm building them. But let's try one more here. Okay, cosecant. Well, let's see, sine is ops over hypotenuse. So hypotenuse over opposite find the cotangent. Now this one didn't come out quite as nice. So let's see here. We got 144 minus 25. So looks like the square root of 119, but remember we're into the negative portion of x. So it'd be like having a negative one square root of 119. So my cotangent cotangent. Let's see. Tangents, ops over adjacent. So adjacent over opposite. Negative square root of 119 over 5. Okay. Or if you didn't want to worry about putting the negative over here, you could just get the 119 and then remember, oh yeah, cotangent's not positive here. See where the negative's coming from on that too. This is just a visual way of doing it. 
You don't have to use the visual way. I just think it can help sometimes. And then our last one, we're between 270 and 360. Again, making that triangle with the x-axis with our reference angle at the origin. Okay, cosine is 6 over 7, find sine. Well, let's see. All students take calculus. So here it's cosine and secant that are still going to make us happy campers. So I'm like, sine, I know sine's going to be negative. If cosine adjacent over hypotenuse is 6 and 7, again, just work it out. 7 squared is 49. 6 squared is 36. It's going to give me the square root of 13. But again, think about it. The x value is positive because it goes to the right. My y value would take on a negative square root of 13. Because again, I'm coming down into the negative portion of my y-axis. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. And that's just how we're going to keep working these. But again, don't make more work. Cosecant inverse is sine. <clears throat> just take the reciprocal and go with your answer that way. So this is kind of the algebraic portion of our identity work. So any issues on the algebra side? Because now we get to start playing with those identities at the top finally. Go flipping. So on the back, we're going to attempt to simplify these expressions. This is kind of the first part of dealing with the trig functions. So the simplified form can be written as a numerical value, which we don't do as often unless it comes out to be 1, or in terms of a single trig function. That happens much more often. So any trig identity can be used to simplify. So here's how this is going to work. We're going to do a little flip back and forth here at times, or what I might even do, because I gave myself a second sheet for a reason here. So for instance, here it says simplify. I notice that 1 minus cosine at the front. So I sit there and I say, hey, didn't we just a minute ago do something that ended up equaling 1 minus cosine. We did when we turned that into sine squared. So here's how this works. I'm going to take that 1 minus cosine that we had before, the equals sine squared, and I'm literally going to change it into that value. <clears throat> now here's the other thing, and I can't guarantee this will work every time, but a lot of times it will. We're going to try to get everything into sine or cosine. In other words, if it's secant, if it's tangent, cotangent, cosecant, whatever, if I can find a way to manipulate that into something that says sine or cosine, that's going to help me. And the reason that is, is all of these somehow will turn into that and it's going to be much easier to cancel. So like for instance here, I don't want to keep secant as secant. I'm going to turn it into 1 over cosine. Just kind of stay with me here for a minute. And then cotangent's the real stinker. Because you look at that and you're like, well, this is right next to it. I'm going to use 1 over tangent. Cotangent's also cosine over sine. So. I'm going to turn it into cosine over sine. And by doing all that, now I can start canceling stuff. So like I can cancel out the cosines. And if I didn't see it right away, oops, let's keep using theta here. <clears throat> 
I get to this at the end. This works the same way that you would work a exponent. This would be the equivalent of if you had x squared over x. You're like, oh, I'm just subtracting the exponents, so it would just be x. Same thing here. Okay, Sine squared theta just means I have two sines that I'm multiplying together. So I could just use the exponent rules too. Otherwise, I can just cancel those out and get to sine theta. And this is what we mean by getting it to a single trigonometric function. Keep manipulating and working things to finally get down to just one thing, whether it's sine, cosine, whatever it happens to be. The tricky thing about simplifying is you're not quite sure when you're done unless you can get it down to a simple value or a single solution. So for instance, I look at this next one on number nine. I go, okay, what might I want to turn cosecant into? One over sine. Okay. What about tangent? Yeah, sine over cosine. Oops, I don't want to cross that out. I wanted to get my theta finished. There we go. I can cross out the sines. And I end up with 1 over cosine, but I'm not quite simplified yet. Where do you see 1 over cosine? Secant. That's when I don't mind going back to something that I had before, even though it's not sine or cosine. When we're trying to get to that single function, a lot of times we'll see inverses in places. But you'll notice all of my work over here was done with sine and cosine to get to that answer. And that's going to be the new thing that you're playing with here that can get a little bit interesting. Now this can get interesting too. Let me, let me do one thing to make this a little easier. I'm going to write this horizontally instead. Because then we can start looking at this a little easier. Okay. Sine. Sine's good. That's one of the things we like these to be. What could I turn tangent into? And here's where the fun begins. You see tangent squared and you're like, uh, secant squared minus 1, but that's not sine or cosine. We were mentioning before one of the things I'm allowed to do is I can do anything that I would do to a normal equation. One thing I can do to a normal equation is square both sides of it. So another identity that I can create for myself is by taking any of these identities here and squaring both sides. So now that tangent squared can become sine over cosine. So here's what we're actually looking at. And we know that when you divide by a fraction, you just multiply by its reciprocal. So our manipulations pay off because now with it being multiply, I can cancel those. And I end up with a single trig for term, a single trig function. I don't need to turn that back around and turn it back into 1 minus sine squared or something. If I get down to a single term, that's, that's my goal of sorts. But just keep telling yourself, sine and cosine for the most part get left alone. Cotangent, similar to what I just did with tangent a minute ago. And it's perfectly fine for you to keep making all these little adjustments over there, because then you can be like, okay, that's fair game. Cosine over sine. Now I have a cosine again. 
So sometimes they may take a while depending on the tweaking I do. Sometimes they will barely take any time at all. If you see it as a base identity already, just use it. But the biggest part of all of this is it's going to be those situations. When you see an identity and you go, okay, wait a minute. Cosecant squared and cotangent squared are both here, but they don't look like this. Can I make them look like this? I sure can. If I minus the cotangent over, again, just a regular algebra move. So I can turn all that numerator into a 1. Yes. 1 minus cosine. Wait a minute, I can make this happen. Sine squared theta is 1 minus cosine squared theta. So that's sine squared. And then just like we'd mentioned before, I can take any of these and by squaring I can get my squared in there. So just like cosecant is 1 over sine, 1 over sine squared is cosecant squared. Anything you can do to an algebra equation, you can do to an identity. So at times that's a nice thing, and at other times that can kind of be pressuresome because you're like, wow, there's lots of things I can do to this, you know? So otherwise it's gonna be tricky to see what I wanna do and what I don't wanna do. All right, eee. piece by piece. So tangent, is sine over cosine. Cosecant is 1 over sine. And secant is 1 over cosine. Holy moly. Again, take it a piece at a time. I got to deal with the numerator first, which is my set of parentheses. So I look and I say, hey, the signs cancel out. I've got 1 over cosine divided by 1 over cosine. Well, I know what I get when I divide something by itself. I get 1. Because if I were to take that second fraction and take its reciprocal, I'd just cross the cosines out anyway. So I can start to see how this, this might not be the worst thing ever. Let's see here. Ooh, now they're going to get kind of big. Here's one thing I want to stress on 15. You do have to follow order of operations, even if it isn't convenient sometime. So let's say just out of, for instance, this would have said cosine squared here instead. I can't turn this into one. Multiply comes before subtract does. So you still have to follow those rules. But I do notice something. I'm multiplying something by its inverse. Cotangent and tangent are inverses, so they're going to cancel. That's going to become 1. So I've got sine squared minus 1. And then down here, I've got cosine over sine times sine. So I'm like, okay, let's see here. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Sine squared minus 1. Well, hmm. If I did that, I could bring the 1 over here. But then if I brought the 1 over, I'd have to subtract cosine back over. So sine squared minus 1 would equal negative cosine squared. Just another manipulation of the exact same identity. There's a whole lot of options I have. So I have negative cosine squared divided by cosine. And like we said before, it's just like dealing with exponent rules. 
cosine squared divided by cosine is cosine, but I have to keep that negative on there. Save the doozies for the end here. And this section we're going to be spending some time in. Actually, these next two with all of our identities and things. It's just important to get some play with them. All right, so we got cosine. Okay, we won't leave that alone. Secant. 1 over cosine minus... Sine over cosine. Not awful yet. Yet. <laughs> One positive thing that I notice here at the start is at least these have a common denominator. I'm not going to have to fight that. So I'm going to have cosine of theta, and then I'm going to divide by 1 minus sine theta over cosine theta. You're like, ooh, this isn't looking fun right now. It was gonna, I was gonna cancel those, but wait a minute, that's divide. It means I still gotta flip this over. So those aren't going to cancel. So you're like, okay. Hmm. So let's see here. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Cosine squared theta. Okay, let's see. Ooh, another manipulation for this one. Okay. So cosine squared would equal 1 minus sine squared. Oh, well, isn't that convenient? Now, here's the part that gets a little more interesting. This isn't the same as my exponent rules because now I have a binomial term with that minus in the middle. All hope is not lost, though, because this is now a difference of squares. So I can break this down into 1 plus the sine of theta, 1 minus the sine of theta, because if I FOIL it back out, 1 times 1 is 1, I get a negative sine theta and a positive sine theta, which will cancel, and then positive times negative is negative sine squared. Perfectly legal to do, and perfectly helpful because now those guys wipe out and that's as simplified as I'm going to get. I can't always get to a single term. It just doesn't work out that way. So you'll notice the only thing that hasn't happened so far, because you know it mentioned up above it could be a numerical value. We haven't gotten to that quite yet. Well, let's see if we can get there now. Remember, multiply trumps add. So I've got to kind of section these off. You're like, wait a minute. Tangent and cotangent are inverses. So they're just going to wipe each other out and make a 1. So 3 times 1 is 3. Hey, wait a minute. Sine and cosecant are inverses. They wipe out and make a 1. 4 times 1 is 4. And you knew it was coming. Cosine and secant are inverses. They'll create a 1. 2 times 1 is 2. And all that stuff just ends up being 9. This stuff is. It's, it's way different from the normal mental exercises we put ourselves through. So, job 1 here today is to work on a worksheet that goes over some similar things. Tomorrow we'll start figuring out how we make one thing prove something else. We get into proofing with this, and we'll spend a couple of days in that too. So 
fun, fun, fun. But jump on in. Make sure you